Hello, hello. Welcome back to Actors Anonymous Podcast. Thanks for uh, coming back, guys. We we took a little break, but we're back. I want to start off this year with an article that I read in news.com.au. It's uh, Chris Hemsworth uh, article, and he talks about how life was bullshit before he made it big and uh, with Thor and how Hollywood is basically bullshit. In an interview with GQ Australia, the 31-year-old said his role as the Marvel comic superhero opened up every door that's available, but also exposed him to the industry's dark underbelly and false veneer. It's bullshit, he said, of his experience being a relative unknown in the industry. I remember how differently people treated me when things went well. Some directors and producers who never gave a shit, at best they'd given me a sideways glance. Next time I saw them, they're my best friend. That's gross. The whole article is great. You should definitely check it out, but there's something in it that stands out. Quote, you get to Hollywood, you achieve something, and then you realize, shit, it didn't actually bring me the happiness I thought it was going to. It didn't fix anything. Look, I mean, I don't wake up, look in the mirror and go, yep, all is perfect. I mean, we're talking about Chris Hemsworth. This guy's, what, 6'4", muscular, gorgeous, smart, wife, three kids. His wife is probably gorgeous. I haven't seen his wife, but I'm guessing she's just as hot as him. And he's a well-known, respected actor. I mean, he's, he's Thor, for God's sake. I mean, he's one of the most, he's in one of the most lucrative and well-known franchises ever, yet his life is not perfect. If you're aiming for those things, fame, money, respect in acting, and think, well, once I get those, my life will be perfect, it won't. There's your proof. This is such an important thing to realize right now. Your happiness should not be dependent on outside uncontrollable circumstances. Why? Because they change and fluctuate constantly. If you live a life where you say to yourself, I will be happy once I get this role. I will be happy once I get that significant other. I will be happy when my favorite Super Bowl team wins. Then what's really going to happen is that if the slightest thing doesn't go your way, you're going to be upset. And if things go really bad for you, for you, you're going to be stuck in a depression. Even if the things you wanted to happen happen, you'll realize, man, it's not exactly how I imagined it to be. And that in turn will make you feel unhappy. Sure, you might have short bursts of happiness when you get out and party or meet with friends or sit at home and have a Netflix binger. But those moments will pass and then you're back to square one. So where should your happiness come from? Inside you. Your thoughts, your perspective on life, your, your acceptance of life and the universe around you. Your mind is an extremely powerful tool. You have so much more control over it than you can even comprehend at this moment. So now you're asking, well, how do I find happiness from the inside? Your thoughts. It's all about your thoughts. It starts with your thoughts. A famous quote by a pretty smart guy, in my opinion, uh, Aristotle. I don't know if you've heard of him. Uh, he's kind of popular on the Twitter. Here's a quote from him. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. Let me repeat that one more time for our listeners. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. I'm going to throw another quote on there. So watch your thoughts. They become words. Watch your words. They become actions. Watch your actions. They become habits. Watch your habits. They become character. Watch your character for it becomes your destiny. If, if somebody could find me on Twitter, the real person who came up with that quote, because like some people say it's Aristotle. Some people say it's some writer in like last century. I don't know who it was. If you find out on Twitter who it is, tweet at me and we'll send you a book on acting or something. <laughs> Everything in life starts from a thought. Think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Look, listen, think. I mean, it's our mantra in this podcast. It's what my dad's been telling me since I was a little kid. It's what the basics of acting are. You, you look, you listen to your partner, you think about what you said, and then you talk. Listen, be happy with what you have right now. Be thankful for what you have. Be, be thankful for the struggle, no matter how small, because our perspective might be limited, but our minds can go on forever. That's my little two cents to start off the episode. Co-hosting with me, as usual, is Mr. Jordan Burbank. Jordan, thanks for coming back. Yeah, you know, I, I, I didn't think I would because I, I, I don't like you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm really excited to have in the, uh, our, our, one of our guests today is Kurt Mega, you might know him from Glee, uh, uh, Switched at Birth, uh, Birth? Birth. Switched at Birth. Switched like at Birth. 
It's like the ghetto. Switch your burf. Switch your burf. And you have a film coming out for the Hollywood Real Festival. It's a comedy film, right? With yeah. some people from Parks and Rec and everything. Yeah. Hey, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. This is great. That, uh, can I just say, that story you said also reminds me of another, another it's a great story, uh, Tony Hale, who played uh, Buster on Arrested Development. Okay. Arrested, Arrested Development, he's the guy that gets the hand cut off. But he has this story he tells where he says he... He was looking, you know, for 10 years, he lived in New York. 10 years, he was waiting tables and doing all that. And he said he had a lot of depression, a lot of things. And he said he kept telling himself, like, when I get that sitcom, like, then, then I will be happy. And then all those things will fall into place. Right. And he said he got it. And it was like, oh, my God, I've got it. I'm on a sitcom. And then he said after the first season, he actually really suffered some pretty severe depression when he realized it didn't fix a lot of things. Wow. And he, and it, the whole, the whole story is the same thing, you know, as Chris Hemsworth. But the idea is like, you have to really love it for what it is because just because you get the big thing doesn't make anything better. Anyway, I was just thinking of that. But great story. But yes, okay, yes, here yeah, I am. Yeah, I mean, hi. <laughs> hi, hi. No, uh, no it's, it's, it's such an important thing to realize because us as actors, I mean, I mean all actors, uh, and especially in this business, are like, hey, I want, I want that series regular role or I want to be in feature films. And you realize when you get it, there are no trumpets and no fireworks when you get that phone call from your agent. Hey, you booked it, great. And it's like, oh, okay. And then you right. get on set and, and you're working. And, and I've been, you know, I've been really lucky to get to work with quite a few people who are series regulars, and I observe their life, and I realize, oh, after that initial phone call, and oh my god, I booked it, it becomes work, and yes. they go to work every morning, and they go home, and you know, even if their bank accounts have high, more zeros in the end of them than ours do, they still like live life b b day day to day, and it it really is just it's a very you know it's it's tough, especially from everybody outside looking in on the on, you know inside like oh my god, if I was there, but. You yeah, know, and yeah, it's great. We love it, but you have to love the thing for the thing. Otherwise, it's not going to be any better once you make more money. You know, it's, it's like one of those things where it, you, you know, as a craft, like you get to be an actor, and it's like it's it's not an easy thing to do, and you have to be really good at it. But it's like being an artist; like you have to be. If you're a painter, you have to be really good at it to to make money off of it. And it's like there's like for every craft that you have, you have to treat it like work. You can't treat that like. You know, everyone glorifies yeah. it, where it's like right. it's still a paycheck. Well, it's like if I was becoming a lawyer and wanted to become a senior partner. Right, it still is a process. My yeah. my one of my very first acting teachers I ever had when I was like ten. He always said this phrase that I loved, and this was, uh, "Love the journey more than the prospect of success." Yes, you have to really enjoy what you're doing more than the idea of being successful at it. Because if you don't really enjoy it, being successful at something you don't enjoy is not necessarily going to make it any better. You know. Oh, so. absolutely, absolutely. Now you. You had a really interesting uh, uh, shindig with Glee, right? I did. It yes, that, that's a very interesting way to phrase it. <laughs> shindig. Um, no, you had a recurring on there. Yeah. And uh, how many episodes? Like, well, it, it, a good number. Though. A total of fourteen. The, the interesting thing about about my experience with Glee is that it, it started a long time before that. They had um, done this thing, and it ended up turning into kind of nothing. But they did this like MySpace open call. Right. Essentially, where they had, like, they were, like, you know, seeing new people for roles. And it was, like, MySpace was, like, on its dying breath. And <laughs> it was, like, MySpace, let's do something to MySpace. And I remember my manager, I had just moved out here, and uh, my manager had said, you know, because I have a background, I did a lot of musical theater. And so he's, like, yeah, you know, and especially, like, that was, like, the end of season one. And he was, like, you know, everybody wants to be in the show. It's impossible to get an audition unless yeah. unless they really want to see you. So just do it, and then I'll I'll – see if I can call casting, whatever. Right. Um, and I did, and I submitted the video, and then nothing happened for three months. And then I got a call out of the blue, and I was I, had, I was living in this tiny little, it wasn't even an apartment, it was a it was a garage that had been like converted into a place where one would sleep with a bed. Right. Uh, in, in Van Nuys, and I'm pretty sure my next door neighbors were meth dealers. I'm positive, actually. Especially after watching Breaking Bad, I'm more convinced than Wait, in Van Nuys? <laughs> yes. Real quick, low footnote, I just saw a uh, um, a bunch of police officers arresting people in Van Nuys. That like, doesn't sound surprising Like It looked like, yeah. a, me like a meth bust. Anyway, <laughs> continue. I'm, they had a bus in their back. Anyway, it was a whole thing. <laughs> it was the Heisenberg thing. Anyway, so... Um, Anyway, so I got a call out of the blue of like, and I was just at my apartment one day, and they were like, "Oh, you, um, uh, you have a, you're meeting with the casting, uh, the the UDK casting, which right. casts all of Glee." And I was like, "Is it like a, just a general?" I didn't know what it was, and so I went there thinking it was just like a generic audition, like, "Oh, cool, I got an, I got an opportunity to audition for a part," but they didn't say what it was, and I showed up. And they were like, oh my God, it's you. We've been searching for you for the last three months. And I was like, what? I had no idea what they were talking about. And they were like, 
you've won the MySpace contest. They're like, we picked you and two other guys out of 250,000 people. You're wow. our top three. One of them is uh, can't make it. He can't fly here. He like doesn't have the resources to get here. Uh, the other guy is flying in tomorrow, and you guys are testing for uh, the next the next like series regular role uh, on Friday. And it was like what. What? So this just like was like a ton of bricks, and they were like, "We've been watching your video and going through for the last three months." Oh, sorry, I said the mic. That's okay. Going through the last three <laughs> months, and, and here you are. Like, where where are you from? Where have you been? And I'm like, I live in Van Nuys. Like, I'm not that far away. And they were like, "Really? You're not from out of town?" And I was like, "No." So um, I live by a meth dealer. <laughs> right. Place. So I was. So that's kind of my first introduction to it. So it was this crazy week of like, then uh, getting coaching and like. Um, Robert Ulrich, who is the casting director for Glee, who is one of the kindest men in the entire industry, mm -hmm. and uh, just a very, I consider him a mentor. He, you know, worked on us very closely and kind of prepped us, and we went to Fox and sort of, you know, we got to do a few days of coaching and prep in the room before and um, work with the music director and all these things. And uh, anyway, so then come around to the next week, I ended up testing, um, and there was like four or five other guys there. They called a few other guys in through more of a traditional agent manager route. Right. Um, and I tested and I got to meet Ryan Murphy and Brad Falchuk and all those people and right. a lot of, you know, the Fox execs. And um, uh, and I could tell right away there were two sets of guys. There were, there were some brunette guys and there were like blonde guys. And so I was like, it's probably going to come down to what what are they looking for, you know? And in the end, they end up casting uh, Cord Overstreet, who uh, plays Sam. And so they wanted a very, like, chiseled, blonde, blue-eyed. And so that whatever. So I didn't get it. Right. And I was devastated. Of um, course. But it, it was an amazing experience. But, you know, yeah, of course, I was like, oh, I thought I was going to get it. And yeah. I'll never be on that show ever again. And I, I blew it. And then two months later, they called and were like, hey, there's an audition today for a one-line co-star. It was one line and one episode. I was like, okay, cool. And so I went in, and then I booked that. And then that turned into 14 episodes. So it was like it a is. very a very strange thing where it went from being like testing for a series regular to auditioning for a small part to getting it to then just keep getting called back repeatedly to the next season getting a solo on the show. So it's it was – and I got to do the tour. So it just – the whole experience was abundantly more – than I ever anticipated. Right. Very, very wild ride. So. It's amazing the the the, sow, uh, the the sows the the seeds we sow. Yeah. And what comes from them. Well, and that's like you know I I, I teach acting too, and I and I coach a lot of kids, and that's what I always tell them. I'm like, look, with there's some there's some cases where actors walk in the room and they're just so breathtaking and brilliant that it's like give that man the job. But the mo the majority of jobs that actors get are not because it's the first time they've gone in. It's just like they're just around, and it's like that guy's cool. I've seen him a lot. We should cast him in something, you know? Yeah. It even happened to me this last week. I had a casting director that I've known for a long time who's never cast me, who I love. And every time I go in, I love I love working with them. And they said, I saw them, they said something to the effect of, I want to cast you in something. It just, it, it hasn't worked out yet, you know? And mm. it's not like, I think, I think we as actors personalize it and we think, oh my God, if I don't get the job, they hate me and I suck. And it's, right. it's just... That's not how it is. It's just, uh, you know, especially with the first round of Glee, I wasn't, I wasn't what the role they were looking for. And now that I saw what they did with it, I was like, I could have never done that. I'm right. not the, I'm not the like, blue-eyed, hot blonde. That's not what I do. It's so it's like, you know what? I can't be that. I can only be the best version of what I am. Well, you know what, Kurt? With some bleach and some laser eyes. Maybe surgery. so. <laughs> no, there, there is surgery now for people with brown eyes that they'll uh, do a laser and they'll oh, burn wow. off the top when, layer and you'll get blue eyes. Holy it's crap. When we come back after the break. <laughs> <laughs> the radical transformation. <laughs> of Kurt Mega. <laughs> That's awesome. So I, I, I want to know a little bit more in detail. Th those moments where that, that, that first moment where you didn't get it, the, the MySpace competition, what, I mean, how did you, what thoughts were you having? What, what kind of habits did you practice to kind of get over that or just to kind of tell yourself, hey, you know, this is, that's okay. These right. things are meant to happen or, or maybe you didn't tell yourself that. I mean, what's well, going in your mind to go through You know, moment? and it's, it's tough because I'm sure you guys have experienced that where you don't always get a call saying it's, it's gone, you didn't get it. It just is that thing of like, if you don't hear, you probably didn't get it. So it was like a good two weeks of wondering, maybe thinking, well, you know, my manager like, well, we haven't heard by now. And like, mm -hmm. so it's this gradual process where you start to slowly let go of the idea. Right. You know, the first day you leave, you're like, it's mine. And then the next day you're like, oh, I hope I get it. And then it's just sort of two or three weeks out. You're like, I think it's not mine. And yeah, it was tough because, you know, it's something I don't know. 
I don't know. I always say this. I don't know how to not make auditions personal. I always hear the advice, don't make it personal. Mm -hmm. Walk out of the door and forget about it. I can't do that because I dearly love doing this. And so whenever you invest yourself into a part or a role, if, you, if you're going to do it well, I think it's always personal. Right. It's, so what you have to learn to do is how to deal with that. I, I, don't think the, the, I don't think it's healthy to stop caring because then it's like, why are you doing it? So for me, it was just an issue of like accepting like, you know what, that was not the right part for me at this moment and it's just not gonna happen. And I really had kind of dealt with it for over a period of two or three months and they had announced who got the part and I just kind of said, well, you know, I guess that's that. And then they called me back and then and that taught me that lesson that I'd heard all my life that I, you know, had never really quite seen in action of like, look, it's not always the first time you know, it's, it's about establishing relationships and about being consistent and about going in and doing well again and again and again. Uh, these know? are things that echo throughout all of our guests. Isn't that right, Jordan? Like yeah. with a lot of our pocket, like staying consistent, just doing your best. But it's amazing to me how much an actor has to juggle emotionally mm -hmm. <laughs> in the room and mentally. Mm -hmm. Okay, you got, you got to be confident, but you can't be cocky. You can't care too much, but you still got to care that you want the job. Right. Uh, but it's like all these things, and then you have to focus on being the character all at the same time. It's like we, we do such a juggling act. And My, some, uh, One of the best pieces of advice is advices? Advice. Advices, yeah. Advice I? I don't know. That's that, better. <laughs> that my coach uh, that I work with here gave me, he said, you really have to appreciate the audition f for being what it is. It is the opportunity to perform and do what you do. It, you can't make it about getting the job. You have to make it about doing your best and, in, and, and taking it as a chance to be like, I'm an actor. Today I get to act. Today I get to do what I do well for people. Because if you make it about the job, there's so many factors that you can't control. You know, you're yes. too short, you're too tall, you're too, too attractive, you're too unattractive. I mean, there's just a lot of things that are out of your control. So all you can do is appreciate the opportunity to go in, make, move and move them in some capacity. And Absolutely. beyond that, it is what it is, you know? You, I, I, I get too attractive a lot. It's, I would see that. I, if you walked in, I'd be like, no, he's just too gorgeous. It's I can't. I can't it's do tough. it. So you need to leave. You're, you're, you're sucking <laughs> up all the attention in the room. <laughs> it's, it's interesting that you, like, you're, that you said that you're so, um, you take it so personally as far as the, the audition process. Like, because we've had other guests on that have said, like, don't take it personally. Don't, you know, keep it as, like, a specific, like, what? That's like, awesome if you can. I haven't mastered what, that what, is skill. It, <laughs> is it the conversation with, like, the, like what is it that you take? Per is there something what I that take, you don't take away? What I take personally is when I invest my time into working on it, I deeply... I, I, I tend to fall in love with playing that character. I mean, sometimes there's roles that you're like, oh, I don't really, not really interested in this. But for the most part, you know, I get auditions and you start to work on it and you'd work on it for a day or two, three days and, you know, or sometimes longer if you have more time. And it's like, I think what is hard for me is you work and we work and you work and you go in and you do it and you walk out and you're like, oh, I never get to play yeah. that character. I love it. Like, so attached to it. Mm. Yeah, there's things that I've re like, I did this one last year. I loved it. It was the funniest pilot script I think I've ever read. And I, I mean, I just had a blast with it. And so when I when I realized I wasn't going to ever get to do it, it it made me more sad in that capacity. So yeah. I don't know if I personalize like this is mine, but I do personalize the sense of like, wow, I really I really care about this part and I want to do it. So it's hard for me to disconnect and be like, ah, pff, I don't give a crap if yeah. I don't book it. <laughs> I'm like, no, I do. Now I know. Now the thing is, how do I deal with that? As opposed to like me trying to make myself callous and not feel anything. Yeah. Because I just then I'm, then because I have I've tried to do that and it doesn't make a very good audition in my opinion. Because the so is thing it more like your I'm sorry. I didn't mean to no, 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 no. <laughs> go ahead. Uh, is it more like the the detachment from a character you create as opposed to the like upset of not getting the not landing the job kind of thing? I I just think for me, if I don't care about really doing my best and really wanting to go after the job, then I don't think I do my best. Yeah. So what I've learned is instead of making myself not care, I will care and then I will learn how to better deal with oh. the fallout of not getting it. Because I've tried where I'll, I don't care and then I just don't think my work is particularly great and mm. I don't think I'm not invested in it. Some people don't do it differently, and I don't think there's necessarily a right or a wrong. If, if you can disconnect and whatever, then that's fine. But the other thing that I've, that I've found to sort of help that process is 
uh, being very proactive in my own creation of my own work um, outside of auditioning for projects. So it's my own, you know, writing and creating my own projects. It's really helped me to walk into a room and not feel the sense of desperation of like, please, I need to act. This is yeah, the only thing I can not do. do that. And it, like, because, you learn that quickly. <laughs> like, it was great. Like, last year, uh, last pilot season, I was doing like two or three projects I was creating on my own with friends. And I had this sense of liberation of like going in, having a blast with the audition, and then kind of thinking like, man, yeah, it'd be great to book this. And yeah, the money would be amazing and all that. But I'm still going to go act today. I'm still going to go this weekend. I'm going to film three things. So like, whether you cast me or not, I'm still going to do the thing that I enjoy. So I don't feel this sense of like, please, I need this so bad. <laughs> right. You know. It, it's, I think it's uncomfortable for everyone in the room when an actor is like that. I would say it's like, if it's casting about... directors can sniff out desperation from the second you oh, walk yeah. in, they're like, oh, God. I, I won't mention the project or the names, but I was in a casting session where I got to be on, got to read for a project, and uh, I was you know, actors were coming in, so I was reading with the actors, and you can, oh my gosh, it's an amazing thing, but you can tell the moment somebody's desperate, yeah, they'll just stick around yeah, <laughs> and, and talk, it's, and it's like, they're just like a little too like, hi, yeah, how are you? Like, it's just a little too like, <laughs> oh, because oh, it doesn't feel sincere, and you're like, you really need this job, don't you? And that just, I don't know, I don't think desperation, uh, in, I don't think desperation really creates really a great work environment. What about crying in the room? If if appropriate, possibly. Okay, but I prefer if not appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's talk about a, uh, okay, Gray Studios. Yes, I do. I'm repping a lot of Gray Studios. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what what uh, you uh, currently teach there, right? Yeah. So uh, yeah, commercial plug. Uh, no, Gray Studios is a studio that I've been studying at myself for the last uh, two or three years, mm -hmm. um, and I've studied at a lot of places in around, um, but. Uh, definitively was the place that I really connected with the most. We, we teach, well, and, and now as of uh, this year, I actually work there. Um, and I coach and I do a lot of improv, I teach improv and I coach kids and stuff. But um, uh, the whole approach of the school is it's specifically audition based. Um, the idea being that unless you're actually booking jobs, you're really not going to get much better. Um, I, I think that one of the problems with becoming a class actor is people get really comfortable in class right. and they feel good about themselves and, you know, we cry and we're vulnerable and all these things, but it's like that and then you get an audition. It's like, how do you translate, like, you know, I did Chekhov in class. How does that translate to, like, how do you book a co-star where you have to, like, say, thank you, here's your check, man, whatever. Like, how do you actually get work so you can start doing the thing that you really do well in the real environment and so that's kind of the approach of the school is it's an audition technique based class yes. uh, focused on um, really working on how to, to make choices that stand out and really set yourself apart uh, to, to best get the job the idea being that working actors are better than non-working actors it's such an incredible thing because you're trying to be so truthful in an artificial environment because auditions are so artificial and that's the whole idea is that auditions are not the same as being on set when you no. when you're in costume and you have these wonderful actors and you know you've had a rehearsal all the great you you can be magnificent now try doing that when the casting director um, is a, not an actor and they're reading flat and you know the cameras here and the lights are terrible and you it's a completely foreign environment mm -hmm. and I know for me for years that that threw me off a lot I'd right be like man when I do theater I feel so connected and when I the few times I've been on set I feel and then I go into the audition room and I'm like. And so that's yeah. really what we try to focus, uh, train our actors on, is is that part, them mastering that that aspect of it. Because that's yeah. everything. The audition is everything. If you can't have a good audition, you will never work. And that just is it's what Part of the is. business. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Uh, that's great. That's such an interesting studio. If people want to find out, uh, graystudios.com? Yeah, it's uh, graystudiosla.com. We have classes in LA, um, but we also do classes in um, San Diego, Orange County, Atlanta, Tampa. Right. Uh, Ohio and then starting in April Dallas so wow. we do a lot of classes in a lot of places we work really closely we have a, a great relationship with a lot of casting directors yes. we bring them in in the summer and in December um, we work a lot very closely with a lot of agents and managers and um, it's a great place and it's honestly and I'm not just saying it because I work there it's the place that I really saw tremendous growth at and so when I was uh, looking for work that I could do when I wasn't auditioning and acting um, that was the first place I thought of, and so when I approached them and said, I'd love to maybe teach for you, and so that's kind of where that relationship came from. That's great. So it's interesting, back on the theme of happiness, you found your happiness almost, uh, not. I mean, you're acting and everything, but it's a different uh, platform right. for you to utilize that. 
Well, and, the, and it's wonderful. They're, they're so supportive there. Um, there's three or four instructors besides the head instructor. Um, his name is David Gray, and he's great. He's, he just uh, most recently was he did was like Todd Palin and Game Change in the HBO movie opposite mm. Julian Moore. And I mean, he's just oh, worked yeah. for years. And so the people they bring in and that coach and teach uh, us as well as the head coach, David, yeah. all, all of us are working actors. So when we're te- you know, telling kids do this, it's not like back in 1983 when I lived in New York. It's like, <laughs> no, this is what's happening now. Right. You know, he, uh, David just went in a few days ago for, you know, like a, a new uh, FX show and he was working on lines the same as all of us are. And so there's just this sense at the studio that we are all in this collectively actually doing the real thing um, and, and, and less about let's, you know, do plays and, you know, feel. It's like, that's great. We can get that later. Let's let's focus on getting work. That's awesome, man. Um, GrayStudiosLA.com. <laughs> you have a... You have a film coming out soon, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Hollywood Real Festival. Correct? Yes, uh, that, it's it's premiering at the Hollywood Real. It's Festival. premiering at the yes. Hollywood Field. Yes, yes. in two weeks, and this film is called uh, Spare Change. Spare Change. Yeah, wonderful. And uh, you, how did you get involved with this? One? Yeah, so um, I got involved last year with a uh, sketch troupe called uh, yeah. TMI at Second City, which is a really cool group of people. We do they are topical sketch comedy. I know you hosted a show there. They're great. I'm looking right in the camera. Yeah, mm-hmm. what's up, TMI? <laughs> And, uh, yeah, so I got involved. They actually asked me to, to host as a guest, mm-hmm. um, similar similar situation, um, because of the Glee thing or whatever. And um, I was actually doing a lot of sketch comedy at the time, and I was doing some of my own, and I was doing a tour with a friend. And, and so they kind of were like, oh, and you also do sketch comedy. Come host. And I loved it, so I actually was like, I'd love to be part of the cast if you would consider me. And um, so they did, and so I started doing it. And, yeah, one of the guys in the cast uh, had become a producer on a project that was a, a comedy feature film. Cool. And he was like, I think you'd be cool. And we've auditioned with a lot of guys, and I can't find anybody. Come audition. And so I did. And I booked it thinking, oh, it'll be a fun little project. And then that kind of blossomed into um, we got Jim O'Hare from Parks and Rec. He plays Jerry, Gary, Larry, yeah. whatever, Jerry. whatever his name is. <laughs> um, he plays my boss. <laughs> and uh, Allison Becker from Parks and Rec. And uh, a lot of cool just, like, comedy people in L.A. And um, That's great, man. Yeah, so it, it, it's one of those things where, like, it, it, it started very small. And it was just by, like, proactively doing work with really cool people not not we're talking about the whole desperation thing yeah. just like doing your own work with friends that's what opened that door it wasn't like i walked into a room and they were like brilliant cast that man right right it was it was through my own personal connections that i had formed with friends on stage that's right. awesome man uh, we're, we're running out of time shortly but before we go and I, we always one piece of advice for struggling artists uh, and i and what would you give to that actor or or artist. I would say the number one thing especially in this climate is create your own work. There there especially with the technology we have. Nothing it's never been cheaper, it's never been easier. Um, that doesn't make it easy, but it is possible if you get together with fellow artists and create and write and make your own stuff, amazing things can happen and that is the future. That is where things are headed. Mm-hmm. Netflix, Amazon, all those things. People are getting to make stuff that are not necessarily in the in the thing, you know. Yeah original creators who have great ideas if you have an idea don't wait for someone to give you money to do it go find a way to create it on your own that is the best thing i could do and the best advice that i could give to anybody because i've seen it in my own life and i've seen it in a lot of friends lives completely change their life just by by having the courage to start something i agree 100 percent. it's so it's so easy to do that nowadays too like everything's so affordable so right. there's no excuse really it's easy right. to get it out to an audience too. absolutely it's so much like I, like YouTube and everything. Look at the look at the Emmy and Golden Globes. I think one network. I think from the Golden Globes, it was one network show that won an award. Everything else was digital. Oh really? Everything. Oh wow. It's it's that that is is a dying breed. You know, this is <laughs> this is the age for independent creators to do what they do. Absolutely. Kurt, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for having me. Um, are you on the interweb or the Twitter? I am. I am Twitter. I am uh, actually Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. I'm all the same thing. It's just at Kurt Mega. At Kurt Mega. C-U-R-T. GrayStudiosLA.com. GrayStudiosLA.com. Check it out. Thanks for coming on the show. And, uh, yeah, we're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah. The Resistance is the best improv show I have seen in L.A. It's an action-adventure film performed live on stage, completely improvised, fully scored. That's right, there's music that goes along with it. I have personally seen the show, and you will laugh your butt off and feel like a kid again when you see it live. You can find them online at www.resistancecomedy.com, also on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. 
every Sunday at 9 p.m. at Comedy Sports at 733 Seaward Street in Hollywood. Again, that's at Comedy Sports every Sunday at 9 p.m. in Hollywood. Don't miss out on some of the best live action comedy entertainment in L.A. Again, that's resistancecomedy.com. Welcome back. Uh, our second guest today uh, is a complete honor on our part to have you in the studio with us, Mr. Gary Marsh. He is the creator and co-founder of Breakdown Services, uh, something very crucial for all actors. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, you're welcome. Yeah, this is uh, this is big for us because uh, Breakdown Services, I mean, they've been around for a while and it's been evolving for actors, correct? Oh, it, it definitely has evolved. Uh, you know, the service, I started it in 1971. Mm -hmm. um, I was an actor, and my mother was an agent, and she uh, needed somebody to go around, read scripts, and tell her what roles were in those scripts. And uh, my mother didn't pay me enough. Ooh. <laughs> and uh, so I made copies of what I was doing, and... Uh, started encouraging agents, other agents, to pay me for my synopses, my breakdowns. So and, smart. And, you know, total brick and mortar operation. Right. Today it's completely digital. Uh, and especially now, the last, what, 10 years, I would say, or even longer, maybe 10, 15 years. I mean, this is the perfect time for, uh, I think, uh, the digital service of uh, breakdowns because it's so accessible to everyone. It is now. Initially, yeah. the studios, the casting directors, would not allow us to provide breakdowns to actors. You know, mm. I mean, they threatened me with, uh, "Well, we're not going to give you scripts if you give breakdowns to actors." Wow. Uh, the digital age uh, and the development of uh, actors' access mm -hmm. changed the game completely. Yeah. And. So the, uh, I think it was that the casting directors didn't have to open up uh, envelopes and get paper cuts. And uh, so they were more receptive to allowing actors to submit themselves via Actors Access. Right. Did you feel a, a, a shift in, in the breakdown services when uh, Actors Access came along? Did you say, oh, well, now we can reach out to even more people? Is that when you felt it? Oh, definitely. Uh, it, it really changed the nature of breakdown. Uh, mm -hmm. The breakdown from 71 to uh, 2003 was really a service exclusively for agents and managers, mm -hmm. and primarily in New York and Los Angeles. Right. After, I mean, our first website was 1996, and we struggled, you know, learning the technology yes. and changing over breakdown. But... Uh, 2003 uh, was when we uh, launched Actors Access and started encouraging and uh, casting directors to allow us to post uh, certain breakdowns on uh, on Actors Access so they could sub so actors wow. could submit. I, I get I'm I'm so excited about this because it's putting more power in in the starting off actor's hands, you know? Because there's so much out of our control as actors. But like with breakdown services, like, no, we can we can see what's available to us. We don't necessarily have to have an agent or a manager to help us get started. The reality is that of all the stuff we release in a week, we can only get casting directors to allow us to release about 20% of that. Oh my gosh. Oh, wow. But you know, there's a. It's not that the casting directors are opposed to actors. It's actually the opposite. But when we release a breakdown mm -hmm. to the agents, within half an hour after the release of a, a standard project, feature film, episodic television yes. pilot, there are about 500 submissions. In about two hours, there's 2,000 submissions. I believe it. Per role. And the casting director has a short amount of time to cast. They see usually one actor every 10 minutes. That's six actors in an hour. They've got five, six, 10 actors to cast. It, you know, we're all a victim of, of time crunch. Mm -hmm. And they would love to see more actors, but time doesn't allow it. Right. Um, when they have a project that is a scale plus 10, a low budget, 
um, the agents aren't so quick to submit. So that's when the casting director goes, oh, actor's access. But that's really good for the beginning actor because th those scale plus 10 projects, those indie projects, uh, are a great hotbed for new talent to be discovered. Um, and so I think it all fits in the mesh. You know, what you just said, it's so crucial for actors to know about this because you'd be surprised how many actors don't know that, you know, like only, you know, how many people are really being submitted for each role. Yeah. It's, it's an incredible number. Um, and I think, you know, they're, they're, it's a double-edged sword. Yes, it's easier to submit for stuff, but yeah, there are more people submitting for it. Um, however, I still think it's a positive and and great way this uh, the breakdown services has evolved. W where do you see it going? I mean, do you have a projection where it's going to be five years from now? I mean, is it pretty much going to be in the same uh, same venue it's at right now, or or can you tell us? Is it a secret? <laughs> Well, certainly there are some things that are a secret. You're right. Uh, the um, really we it's a combination of us trying to lead the market mm -hmm. and listening to actors, listening to agents, listening to casting directors in terms of what their needs are. I'll give you a couple of of examples of of ways that we have led the market. About a year and a half ago, two years ago, we. Uh, started a thing called Slate Shot. Hmm. And Slate Shot is a seven second slate, an actor's slate, that um, actors can add one free slate to their portfolio on our system. And they merely slate their name. Casting directors love it because the days of a picture, um, which is flat, doesn't give a lot of information. Right. It may be numbered. Five years from now, it may, a picture may really be a secondary piece. Just like black and white photos didn't give skin coloration, mm -hmm. color photos did, but a slate shot gives you a sense of the person's voice, their personality, and shows you what they really look like. Absolutely. And casting directors like that. I mean, it, you know, taking a step back for a second, one of the things that's, you know, as a former actor, I do not believe that actors should have to pay to play. So we try to build in free services all the way along to allow an actor to, to be able to be present mm -hmm. on our site. Two pictures, a resume, a profile, a slate shot, all of those are free. Now, if they've got an agent, they don't have to add the ability to submit themselves through Actors Access, which is a yearly fee. Yeah. So an actor isn't forced into a position where they have to pay to be in our system so that their agent can submit them and help them get jobs. Right. Um, another thing that we... Um, launched was uh, Casting About. It was actually created by an actor and his friend, Blair Hickey and Brian Wald, two great guys, and uh, Blair's a great actor, and he created Casting About for himself, which isn't breakdowns, but it is a tracking system to keep um, an eye on every casting director in L.A. and New York, mm. what they're doing the status of every project. It allows them to keep notes on every casting director or every project right. they've been involved in. It includes a log line, and they can click on a casting director's name and find out what that casting director is doing current and what they've done in the past. So when an actor goes in for an appointment, they're not just going in for the appointment that they're going in on. They have a much bigger picture of what that casting director is doing, who the assistant is. It's, it's a world of knowledge, and in today's world, it's all about information. It's always That's been about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's great, because it also gives, I mean, one, it's, it's people 
being held responsible for doing their homework as like as an actor and also you don't just go in for that one role but you you create a relationship by saying like I've like researched this person I I I've learned about you because I'm very interested in working with you and it it puts the it puts the responsibility to an actor to work that much harder to make that relationship work it's a very important point um actors typically go into uh, an interview and it's all about them. And, you know, there's that neediness, unfortunately, that is sort of comes out of their pores. And if an actor uh, walks into that appointment and says, look, I'm, I'm a pro, you're a pro, I tell certain stories, you cast certain stories, if I can help you do your job oh. today then that's great. And to walk in knowing that casting director, and if the opportunity, you know, comes up and it's, you know, it's, it's real, and they can say, hey, you know, uh, this project uh, you cast two years ago, I loved, you know, how the, your casting, I, you know, that was amazing. It was one of my favorite shows. And it's real and it's authentic, not forced. I mean, then the casting director, all of a sudden, they get to talk about themselves. Nobody worries about the casting director who, Absolutely. and most casting directors started out as actors. Yeah. So they go from talking about themselves to listening to actors talk about themselves. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ask a good question of a casting director, they might remember you more. You know what? This is, it takes a step further. Like, uh, Knowing what the casting director has cast is so crucial because if you go into an audition and you realize, oh, they've been casting a lot of Disney and Nickelodeon things, you're going to tweak your performance completely, whether they've been doing a lot of stuff for AMC or, <laughs> you know what I mean? So th these these services and, and doing your homework, I think, you know, like you said, information is crucial. It, uh, you know, knowledge is power. And the more knowledge you have, the more weapons and, and tools you have in your arsenal. Absolutely. You make an incredibly valid point there really knowing what stories that casting director tells right. or casts. And, uh, you know, Blair says that, uh, you know, you don't need to know every casting director in town. And there's a, about 230 that work consistently. Mm -hmm. You can't know 230 casting directors. But you should know the, the casting directors that tell the stories you tell best. And every actor has certain stories they tell better than others. Yes, yes, absolutely. We've got to work your strengths, especially in the beginning. Absolutely. So it's important uh, to know who th those casting directors are. Then I, w I want to branch off on, on that. Uh, back to the uh, submitting yourself yes. for actor's access. Know, what, know who you are. Know what you're right for. Don't submit for every single project because not only are you not doing yourself a favor, you're wasting space and time on the casting directors who are sifting through, you know what I mean? Simple things like they're, they're looking specifically for a, a black hair, brown eyed person. If you're blonde and blue eyed, don't submit yourself for that. You'd be surprised how many actors in the beginning just submit for everything. They think it's a good idea. Oh, absolutely. But you know, I mean, the theatrical world uh, fortunately doesn't focus on physical, uh, you know, uh, blue uh, eyes, blonde. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's certainly extremely valid with commercials and industrials. Yes, yes, um, that, that's true. The, one of the things, we, I mean, that we approach it from a positive point of view is if the breakdown says must speak Spanish, then you are best to put in your note, uh, live two years in Mexico City. Uh, take a look at what the casting director needs and validate your submission with that need being explained. Oh, yeah. And the casting director is looking for that. Um, one of the other things is if you notice that that um, project is uh, going to location in Pittsburgh. Yes. And you're from Pittsburgh. Of course, you should say, I'm from Pittsburgh and I could be a local hire. It's really just being intelligent Mm -hmm. and fitting, you know, round peg, round hole, and not trying to just jam it in. 
um, because there's so many other people submitting themselves. And if you're not authentic to that submission, it's a waste of time. We tell, cast, uh, we tell actors, actually, e in terms of wasting their time, if it's off the first page of Actors Access, you're too late. Ah. Do not submit. Don't waste your time. Hmm. Wow. Now why? Speed. Speed. The speed. A casting director, when they turn out a breakdown, um, they're already starting to look within two hours. And chances are, you know, it has rolled off the first page and they've already scheduled their appointments already. Mm. So it, it, there's a lot of elements to being an intelligent, proactive actor. And that's a very important part. Another amazingly important part that most actors don't follow up on is marketing themselves. Now, actors sell themselves by submitting. You know, it's, it's easy. You know, I submit myself, I get an interview, I hopefully get a job. Right. Marketing yourself, when you're dealing with, let's say, 2,000 uh, submissions, how do you stand out? I mean, a casting director typically will bring in about 20 actors per role for an episodic. How do you get to be one of those 20? It's, it's all about marketing, really, uh, for the smart actor in today's world. Um, you have to uh, send a postcard to the casting director. Postcards, I can't state enough how valuable postcards, even in this digital age, really? are very, uh, very important. Mm. They get stuck up on cork boards. And more importantly, rather than sending it to the casting director, send it to the casting assistant. Mm. And, you know, it's like... You, you go to the store, why do you pick one product over another? A lot of it is subliminal. A lot of it is that, you know, the rules of advertising, seven impressions, so yes. on and so forth. So the more times a casting director touches you, they're going through submissions. Oh, I know him. Let's bring him in. And that marketing approach is really the way to more successful submitting so rather than just submitting yes. and hoping that a casting director says, oh, I like his look, I'm going to bring him in. More to the point, oh, th that actor was in this. They sent me a, a thing that they were in a student film or in a, uh, in a festival, right. uh, in a theater piece. You're just increasing your chances of hopefully them remembering your face and going, yeah, I, that face looks familiar, the postcards, yes, you know what, why not, kind of thing. That happens more often than not, correct? I mean, my one of my casting directors, they, have, they go through their postcards all the time, and some casting directors, they don't, but, I mean, you, you never know until you try. I mean, it doesn't hurt. Exactly, and the more you can personalize your postcard, you know, I see that you're, you, you know, congratulations. I see that you've got this new pilot, uh, this uh, uh, law show. Oh, and, and by the way, I was, last year I was cast in two uh, shows, this one and that one. You know, the, the actor doesn't look at it a lot of times from the point of view that their job is to help the casting director. The casting director, their job is to find people to fill slots. Yes. Um, and they're always looking for new people. I mean, you know, the, the joke was in New York on Law & Order that if you weren't cast in Law & Order and didn't have that on your resume that you weren't really an actor. Um, they run out of people on these shows and NCIS. Um, yeah. They need you. Most actors don't approach it from that point of view. If you approach it from the point of view that casting directors need you, if you can tell the story they are looking to cast, then you're valuable to them. We forget, we forget to look at the projects we're submitting for as stories. And at, at the very core, actors are storytellers. They're part of a story. 
Absolutely. I mean, back to what Greek times when you're literally <laughs> the chorus is telling the story. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I, I love that perspective you have on acting, and I think it needs to be, uh, you know, uh, that, that fire needs to be relit again for actors. Um, it just goes into a deeper meaning, and uh, I love that. Storytellers. Story, story, story. Um, th this is great. I like this. It, it, the, there's a little pamphlet you just gave us, uh, basically uh, managing your acting career in the digital age. If somebody wanted to get one of these, where would they go? Uh, at Breakdown. Breakdown, uh, great. It's also... Uh, in PDF form, they uh, it's on our oh. website, on our Facebook page. Oh, excellent! Um, this is because this is super helpful. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a lot of information. We we didn't, you know, it's not a we're we're not selling anything. Yeah, we're we're we see ourselves as educators of and trying to help actors. There's a lot of different uh essays and pieces in there yeah uh that aren't really selling anything in particular they're just giving advice trying to help an actor focus on their career trying to make sure that actors understand how to treat their career positively as a kid you know i was a child actor oh my god it, it turned into such a negative and you know actors you know, the, I've heard actors go, you know, this casting director brings me in all the time and I never book. They must hate me. The, oh, oh, my God. The, our, our previous, <laughs> uh, you, weren't, you weren't in here, but Kurt just yeah. said the exact same yeah. thing you said. How <laughs> actors feel that way sometimes when they've gone in for like eight, nine, ten times and they're like, they, there's no way they like me. There's no way. <laughs> and it's, it's like, you forget that they've been constantly bringing you back in and you're like, okay. <laughs> The casting director's job really is to, I mean, the actors they bring in, what they're really doing is saying, I'm to their produ what they're saying to their producer is, I'm vouching for these 20 actors. Any one of them can do the job. I believe in these people. You pick the person that you need. Absolutely. And most casting directors think, oh, my producer is such an idiot. They can't see <laughs> these great actors I'm bringing in, and they they pick the wrong one. And of course, they can't say. Well, and sometimes they do say you're picking the wrong actor. Right. But ultimately, you know, the producer is their employer. They're independent contractors, just like actors. They have to please their boss. You know what? And if you're if you're a good actor and a and a, and a uh, well, a good actor in the sense of your heart's good, you'll realize that, hey, there are other good actors out there, not just you. So, uh, you know, when you go in for a role, especially when it becomes higher up, pilot, you know, producer session, or even for certain uh, guest star roles, hey, you're working with the best, so your competition is going to be the best if you're on that level. So th there has to be a certain amount of respect you have to have for the other actors, for the casting director, knowing that they're under pressure too from the producers. Producers are under pressure from the network. So, um, you know, again, you put it so simply, and I keep going back because I love it. It's, are you, are you the right storyteller for the story? You know, what kind of story are you telling? And is it right for that? And, and you know, I can't claim, uh, claim ownership of that. Oh, you I mean, can. It's okay. No. <laughs> okay. I, it was, you know, I, I, I first heard Blair explain it that way, and I, I had never thought of it that way myself. Mm -hmm. And it was just... It was a revelation to me. I wish I had seen it that way mm -hmm. when I was a, an actor in my teens. Yeah. And it, it, I may still be an actor today, but, I, you know, well, I, 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 I couldn't stand going on interviews after a while. Well, <laughs> unfortunately, we're running, we're, running, we're running out of time. I said that like five times. We're, we're, we're running out of time. Um, you don't know how much of an honor and how thankful I am for you to be on this show. You know, that negative negativity you felt as a child actor, unfortunately, when I first came out to Los Angeles, there was tons of that. And uh, this podcast, I, my aim with, one of my aims for it is to eliminate that negativity for the true actors out there with one another. Because it should be a fellowship. It should be a camaraderie between us because there's already enough things to worry about. We don't we need to get rid of a lot of the negativity and remember the positive things about our business, about our craft, about what we do. And Breakdown Services is such a huge part of the positivity and, and 
and structure for a good, healthy, not only acting career, not only business career, but also a personal life. And I want to thank you again for creating such a, 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 a worthwhile asset. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, yeah. Total pleasure. <laughs> we've, we've run out of the sh time for the first show. Uh, Jordan, thanks again for co-hosting. Oh, always a pleasure. Uh, I'm always here. Gary, are you on the <laughs> interweb on Twitter or uh, are you just... I'm uh, through the company. Yeah. Uh, we have, uh, you know, on Actors Access Twitter Great. Um, and face Facebook. And uh, so, yeah, I'm there. You're there. You're there <laughs> through the through the company. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, you're still at Jordan Burbank 7? Yes. Yeah, I forgot it. <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't tweeted in a while. It's been a long two months. So. I know. I know. Um, uh, Nicole, our social media coordinator, uh, thanks for coming on. And uh, doing a great job. Uh, where can they find you again? Well, she doesn't have a microphone. That's fine. There, I'll, I'll say it through the. I'll say it through this. Uh, Nikki five nine two on Twitter. Nikki five nine two on Twitter and Instagram. N I K I. N I K I. Nine five two. Five nine two. I knew you were gonna forget that. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have you say it into my microphone just so we get it correctly, so people don't. Uh, Hi. It's Nikki592 on Twitter, N-I-K-I, and Nicole underscore Gabrielle on Instagram. Yay. I want to thank <laughs> Kurt Mega again for coming on earlier. Uh, and Mr. Gabe, thank you so much for uh, sound engineering. He did a little bow. I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> like what say? He went, and we basically went, yes. Uh, you can find me at we Sam Keish. Check us out on our uh, website. We, we revamped it, actorsanonymouspodcast.com. Uh, hit us up on Twitter, social media, Instagram. We love hearing from you. And always remember to listen, think, and then talk. <laughs>